Okay, it's uh, it's 10 o'clock, so we will get started. Um, I'm Peter Adams from uh, Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce the, the two speakers today. Um, and I want to thank uh, Svasti Harisharan, who is the uh, the series organizer of this uh, this SPP Cancer Center seminar series. So thanks again, Svasti, for organizing. Um, today we have two two great speakers talking about um, the role of cell senescence um, with a perhaps a, an emphasis on on tumors and and cancer. So tumor senescence. Uh, and the two speakers are Catherine Ed and, and, and Judy Campisi. So I'll, more about the, the two of them later, um, but really two, two great speakers. Um, uh, the only other thing I want to say is that, so put questions in the, in the Q&A and then uh, Sfasti will, will moderate the questions. We'll have questions after each individual talk and then there'll be a um, a joint Q and A after after both of the both of the talks are done, and, and as I say, it's fastly we'll we'll moderate those. So you know, my my job here is to introduce the the two speakers, uh, and so our first speaker is uh, Catherine Ed uh, from the the Hillman Cancer Center Center at University of Pittsburgh School of of Medicine, and. I just want to start, I guess, on a little bit of a, a personal note. It's actually a great honor for me to, to introduce Catherine because uh, Catherine did her postdoc with Rugang Zhang at Wistar Institute in, in Philadelphia. And uh, Rugang was, was a, previously a, a postdoc in, in my lab. So it's, this is the first time that I've ever, you know, kind of had the privilege of, of um, introducing a, a, a speaker who was, you know, with whom I have that relationship. So I'm very excited to do that and great to see you doing so well, Catherine. Um, so, so Catherine um, started her own lab in 2016 at Penn State College of, of Medicine. Uh, in 2020, moved to the Hillman Cancer Center at University of, of Pittsburgh, where she's an associate professor with, with tenure. So, you know, she's only had her lab for a few years, but really has, you know, been making uh, fantastic contributions and, and, and has a very well funded lab funded by NIH, ACS, the DOD, and a number of uh, foundations, including the W.W. W. Smith Foundation. And so Catherine has really made a, a name for herself in looking at um, the role of epigenetic and, and metabolic interactions initially in, in cell senescence, but now extending that, to, but also extending that to, to cancer and in particular ovarian cancer. Um, today, I think she's going to talk about um, novel functions of, of P16 in, in senescence in keeping with the, the topic of this series, but, but you know, she's made many other important contributions, including you know, really fascinating study of, on the role of uh, DOT1L in, in senescence, which I just want to highlight because that is actually something that myself and Annie Dishbande had been had been talking about, um, but you know we're, we're beaten to it by 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 Catherine. So I just want to um, again that kind of underscores how uh, how well she's she's doing. So it's really great to have you here to to speak, Catherine. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Peter, um, for that kind very kind introduction. It is a real honor to be here today. Um, to speak for you and also for Dr. Campisi, who is one of my science idols, uh, and tell you all about senescence because I love it. I always tell people it's my favorite biological process. Uh, and I hope by the end of the talk, you'll all feel the same way. So the first thing I am going to do is just give, since I'm the first speaker, give a little bit of background what is senescence? Why is it important? How do we study it before I get to sort of the mean potatoes of my talk? Senescence is actually quite hard to define. While it was once defined as a irreversible cell cycle arrest, um, work at least from my postdoc showed that that's not uh, likely to be the case. Although you could probably ask different people in the senescence field and they would give you different uh, opinions on that. So in my lab, we define it as a stable cell cycle arrest that can be induced by a variety of stimuli, 
Uh, since this is a cancer talk, I chose a number of stimuli that are relevant for cancer. Some that I'm gonna discuss today, like uh, this paradoxical uh, activation of senescence due to an oncogene, but others that are probably relevant to what you study in the lab, whether it's ROS, mitochondrial dysfunction, anything that induces DNA damage, such as radiation, genotoxic stress, chemotherapies, even targeted therapies can induce senescence. So as you can imagine, because a number of different uh, stimuli induce senescence, it's critically important. You know, and I like to joke in the lab that senescence is probably important for literally everything. And I think that this is a good illustration of that. It's important in physiology, for tissue repair, wound healing, embryogenesis. It's also criti critically important in a number of pathologies, you know, uh, age-related pathologies and others as well. So neurodegeneration, type two diabetes, et cetera. Of course, today we're here to talk about cancer. Uh, and I get the question a lot in people outside of the senescence field, is senescence good for uh, cancer? Is it bad for cancer? Is it tumor suppressive or tumor promoting? Well, really the answer is yes, uh, which makes it, hard to study, but very interesting to study. In some contexts, senescence is tumor suppressive, and it's good. In other contexts, senescence is tumor promoting, so that's bad. And actually, I'm going to talk about both today. So we think about studying senescence, like most biological processes, it's not characterized by just one phenotype. So I mentioned the cell cycle arrest, but a number of other markers are uh, very well known to be um, to, to be observed in senescent cells. So my lab made this uh, hallmarks of senescence wheel, you know, a la Hannah Hannon Weinberg's uh, cancer hallmarks. And as you can see, there are a number of hallmarks. And I'm not going to go into each one of these, although I'll touch on many of these today. You're probably used to seeing beta galactosidase staining, but I will note that, you know, if you're interested in senescence, you, you should probably look at, at multiple of these markers. I'm gonna talk a lot about P16 today. So P16 and other cell cycle regulators, regulators and tumor suppressors are highly upregulated in senescence, uh, DNA damage. There is a secret home that I'll touch on, but I'm sure Dr. Campisi will talk about um, in detail. And I'll also talk a little bit about metabolic reprogramming. Okay, so I mentioned P16. Uh, and it, it's, it's critical and a critical cell cycle regulator and a tumor suppressor. You know, and I like to tell the story that um, I was at a, the International Senescence Conference a few years ago and saw Ned Sharpless, director of the NCI, give a talk, uh, obviously uh, very well known to, um, to study P16. And he said, P16 only is important for the cell cycle. And well, by the end of this talk, I hope to convince uh, all of you that actually that's not true. In fact, loss of P16 in particular is likely important for a number of the hallmarks on this senescent slide and therefore also in cancer. So just very briefly to get us all on the same page, what is P16? So I said, it's very important in the cell cycle. Well, how does it regulate the cell cycle? It does this by inhibiting cyclin-dependent kinases. Cyclin-dependent kinases uh, will phosphorylate RB and dissociate this uh, RBE2F complex to allow for E2F mediated gene transcription. So this is proliferation promoting genes, S phase promoting genes, et cetera. Uh, of course, we call this the canonical pathway. I'm gonna tell you today about some non-canonical function of P16, so things outside of RB. I don't have time to really get into it, but our lab isn't the only one that has shown some of these non-canonical functions. And if you're interested, I'll point you to a mini review that a postdoc, uh, Raquel Buch in my lab, um, wrote a few years ago now. So because of its critical role in the cell cycle, you can imagine when it's lost, this allows for you know, these proliferation promoting genes, uh, which is obviously pro-tumorigenic. Because of this, it's well known to be a, a tumor suppressor. In fact, uh, the, the locus, CDK into a locus, which encodes for P16, is uh, hypermethylated, P16 is mutated, uh, the entire locus is, is deleted in about 50% of all human cancers. So of course, understanding its role in fundamental biology is critically important so that we know what it's doing. 
It's also important because there's actually no targeted therapy for this large subset of patients. So we believe that some of the work we're doing may uncover uh, new therapeutic targets for this 50% uh, of all human cancers. I mentioned I'm gonna talk about a lot about oncogene-induced senescence because we use this typically as the model system in the lab when we're thinking about P16 expression. And like all model systems, you know, it has its pros and cons, but I think that this is a really excellent model in which to study P16 because it's really on off, you know, sort of as close as you can get to black and white in biology. So uh, oncogene induced senescence does in fact occur in vivo. We imagine this in the case of benign nevi or skin lesions where you get activation of an oncogene in a completely normal melanocyte. So this is typically a BRAF mutation or an NRAS mutation. This leads to an initial phase of hyperproliferation um, and then induction of senescence. So you can see here their KI67 negatives are not proliferating. They stay in highly positive for P16. That uh, makes sense based on its role in the cell cycle and senescence and their beta galactosidase positive. We uh, did something similar when I was a postdoc and look at benign lesions and uh, melanomas. We um, looked at the mutation status of all of these different lesions. In fact, every single lesion we received, whether it was benign or a melanoma, had a BRAF V600E mutation. But you can see here in the benign nevus, these cells, as expected, are not proliferating, but have very high P16 expression. Whereas melanomas, which are obviously highly proliferative, have lost P16 expression. So at least in the context of melanomagenesis, loss of P16 is thought in part to drive um, tumor progression. And therefore senescence is a tumor uh, suppressive phenotype there. The other piece of background information that I want to give you is so, again, some work I did as a postdoc in Rigong Zhang's lab, where I found that upon induction of, of senescence, or here we're expressing a mutant RAS, HRAS G12B, we lost, um, uh, or we significantly de saw a significant decrease in all foreign D and DPs. Now, importantly, this happened before the cell cycle arrest, suggesting this is a driving event of senescence. Indeed, if we added back nucleosides, either at the time of um, oncogene expression, or in fact, after cells were fully senescent, so actually um, many days after oncogene induction, we were able to bypass or overcome the senescence-associated cell cycle arrest, as you can see here, using beta-gal, BRDU incorporation, and colony formation assays. So uh, you can see that, that this model is really excellent to study P16, because it's on off, to study nucleotide metabolism, because obviously that is critically important. So when I started the lab, um, I was so lucky to recruit um, phenomenal postdoc Raquel Buch, and she wanted to ask, was there a relationship between P16 loss and nucleotide metabolism? And we used senescence as our model system. For the sake of time today, I'm not gonna go through all of the data. So I'll point you to her cell reports paper from a few years ago. All right, so she came to the lab, she set up the model. Here we used a normal human uh, fibroblast, IMR 90s, pretty typical in the senescence field. She overexpressed mutant BRAF. As expected, we saw an increase in P16 expression. The cells are senescent, no surprise there. She then mimicked this uh, early you know, copy number loss or, or loss of P16 expression in tumor genesis by knocking down P16 using shRNA. I'll note that we used you know, multiple independent shRNAs and also rescue experiments, but for simplicity, just showing you one here. Knockdown of P16 um, uh, in the context of BRAF V600E uh, actually bypass senescence. So you'll see me note these cells as uh, senescent bypass cells throughout the talk. So of course, the very first thing we wanted to do was look at nucleotide levels. We have a phenomenal uh, collaborator uh, who does mass spec-based metabolomics, Nate Snyder, who's now at Temple University. And we receive the data back and we're just phenomenally excited to see that knockdown of P16, so these senescent bypass cells had an increase in nucleotides. So if you compare the blue bar here to the red bar, now you may, might make the argument that at least in DNTPs, this is due to the cells being in S phase, so they require more uh, DNTPs. But that ar same argument cannot be made for all of these other nucleobases, suggesting that loss of P16 somehow directly regulates nucleotide synthesis. <laughs> 
We of course wanted to understand this mechanism. We took a high throughput approach. We had RNA-seq data. We had reverse phrase protein array data. Uh, we co cross compared terms that came out of both of these things. Uh, and one term that was very interesting to us was translation or mTOR signaling. And why this was interesting is that Brendan Manning's lab from Harvard had shown in two beautiful science papers a few years ago, or a few years before we did the, this work, that uh, mTORC1 directly regulates both purine and pyrimidine synthesis. And we had indeed seen an increase in both purines and pyrimidines. This suggested to us that maybe upon loss of P16 expression, mTORC1 was activated to increase nucleotide synthesis. Of course, the very first thing we did is just uh, make sure that mTORC1 was indeed upregulated uh, upon senescence bypass. As you can see here, uh, both S6 kinase and 4-ABP1 were highly phosphorylated, suggesting an increase in mTORC1 activity. We then uh, depleted mTORC1 activity using a uh, small molecule inhibitor, Temsirolimus, doing its job by uh, decreasing S6 kinase and 4-ABP1 phosphorylation. We then sent these cells to uh, metabolomics again. And as you can see in the purple bar, this completely abrogated the increase in nucleotides. Here, just showing you a, a few examples. So this suggested to us that the increase in nucleotide synthesis was uh, at least in part through mTORC1 activity. But did this have anything to do with uh, the senescence bypass? Indeed it did, because if we take these cells that have undergone senescence bypass and we treat them with the mTORC1 inhibitor, this completely abrogates the effect. I'll note that that wasn't the case when we take parental cells. So if we take the parental cells and treat them with the same dose at the same time of temsirolimus, it has absolutely no effect on their proliferation, really suggesting that this is specific for those cells that have bypassed senescence due to loss of P16 expression. And that will be important as I come back to you know, targeted therapies towards the end of this first part of the talk. To get at how mTORC1 was specifically regulating nucleotides in our model system, we decided to perform a, perform a polysome profiling analysis, since mTORC1 is clearly important for translation. And we were specifically looking for transcripts that shifted from the light fraction in senescent cells to the heavy fraction in bypass cells, suggesting an increase in translation and protein synthesis. For the sake of time, I'll just get right to the hit that we validated, which was RPIA. You can see here, down in the light, up in the heavy, and indeed we see an increase in protein expression of RPIA in senescent bypass cells. That was mTORC1 dependent. If we treat cells with temsirolimus, this abrogates RPIA protein expression. We did a number of experiments to show this was direct translation of the RPIA transcripts, but I won't show um, those data today. So why did this make sense? Well, RPIA is a critical enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway to produce ribose 5-phosphate. And remember, ribose 5-phosphate is the sugar backbone for both purines and pyrimidines. So it made a lot of sense that we saw an increase in nucleotides uh, and also an increase in RPIA. Of course, we wanted to test that the nucleotide synthesis uh, that we observed was through the pentose phosphate pathway. We did a number of experiments, just going to show you one example here where we did isotope tracing. So here we fed cells universally labeled glucose. All six carbons are labeled and therefore you can follow the, the fate of each carbon. So M plus five means the five carbons of either ribose 5-phosphate or nucleotides uh, were derived from glucose and therefore uh, through the pentose phosphate pathway. As you can see here in the cells that bypass senescence have, have, have an increase in RPIA protein expression. They also have an increase in RPIA activity, presumably because we see an increase in ribose 5-phosphate derived from glucose. And this is mTORC1 dependent. Similar results were observed in nucleotides, although you know, I will note that some of the nucleotides didn't show um, a marked increase uh, in uh, tracing from glucose in senescence bypass cells. And actually we're following up on these experiments now. Uh, this, these data may suggest to us that not only is de novo nucleotide synthesis going on here, but also the salvage pathway. Again, we wanted to understand whether RPA um, expression was required for the cells to, un to bypass senescence. There's no pharmacological inhibitor. So again, we took a genetic approach where we knocked down RPA using two SHRNAs. As you can see, we get really nice knockdown and this completely abrogated the senescence bypass. 
Again, won't show you the data, but in normal cells, they don't care. You knock down RPA, they proliferate just fine. So this suggests that this entire axis of mTORG1, RPIA, nucleotide metabolism is a specific metabolic vulnerability of these cells that have bypassed senescence due to uh, loss of P16 expression. So I just said that, right? So in the context of cancer initiation, if we think about uh, oncogene-induced senescence being tumor um, suppressive, when we lose P16 expression, obviously there's an increase in the cell cycle, no doubt, but we also see an increase in nucleotide synthesis. But I mentioned in the first part of the talk that there's no targeted therapy for uh, the patients with low P16 expression. And so could we use this knowledge of senescence and senescence bypass uh, to target you know, full-blown cancers with low P16 expression. Um, to do, to answer this question, we took a variety of uh, cell lines with wild type P16 so that we could knock them down and have isogenic cells. Uh, as you can imagine, this was actually quite, quite challenging, but we did end up with um, uh, seven cancer cell lines with wild type P16 expression where we could knock down P16. Um, as in similar to our IMR 90s, if we knock down P16, we saw an increase not only of mTORC1, which I'm not showing you, but also RPIA protein expression. We then knock this down either alone or in combination with uh, knocking down P16. As you can see, and similar to what I had noted previously, if you knock down RPIA alone, the cells don't care at all. They proliferate just fine. However, in the context of low P16, now these cells um, have, have troubles proliferating, and in fact, they undergo senescence. So that was in vitro. Here are the results from in vivo. You basically see the same thing. The knockdown RPIA in the context of P16 low tumors, this significantly decreases tumor burden. Um, and in a uh, marker of senescence, which is a decrease in LAMIN B1, we saw induction of senescence. So this is super exciting and suggests to us this entire pathway might be targetable uh, for P16 low cancers. So to con conclude this first part of the talk, I showed you that loss of P16 expression increases mTORC1. I didn't have time to show you, but we actually found that this was in an RB independent fashion. We're also working on the upstream mechanism of this currently in the lab, trying to understand the mechanism. I showed you that this increases mTORC1 activity, RPIA uh, translation, expression, and activity to increase nucleotide synthesis. And this was not only uh, required for the cells to bypass senescence, but also is a novel metabolic vulnerability for P16 low cancers. All right, so to switch gears a little bit, to st but still talk about P16, we had a somewhat uh, fortuitous and unexpected finding you know, I mentioned to look at lots of markers as you look at senescence. And one marker that we did um, on the side and we're surprised by the findings was uh, uh, markers of DNA damage or uh, DNA double strands breaks like 53 BP1 and gamma H3X. So it's well known that senescence cells uh, show an accumulation of DNA damage and that's shown here. But in fact, when we knock down P16, these cells don't even undergo senescence, they completely bypass senescence, but they also had a marked increase in uh, markers of DNA double strand breaks. And why this was interesting to us is that it's well known that DNA damage can regulate the senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP. So the SASP, which I'm sure Dr. Campisi is gonna talk about in, at length is this um, um, to microenvironment. It's both uh, beneficial and detrimental in a very context dependent way, composed of a number of soluble and insoluble factors. This is actually a very interesting area of senescence right now. And why we were interested, uh, why we thought that this might be relevant in P16 low cancers, as I mentioned, DNA damage is well known to induce, and a loss of lamin B1 is well known to induce cytoplasmic chromatin fragments. In fact, Peter Adams and Shelley Berger's lab have shown this, uh, to allow for increased uh, signaling uh, through C-gasting and an increased transcription of these genes. Well, not only did we see an increase in DNA damage, we knew lamin B1 was down, but we also had seen an increase in nucleotides, which is actually important for C-gas activity. Uh, additionally, Dr. Campisi's lab had shown that overexpression of P16 alone, while it induces senescence, doesn't induce the SASP. And this gave us, again, some um, rationale that maybe loss, that P16 restrains the SASP, and if you lose it, it would, you know, massively increase. So we had this hypothesis, 
um, and, and we've published these data, but it turned out we were completely wrong, which is always fun, um, <laughs> but, but fully okay, because in fact, this project has taken some really new and interesting twists. So the same model system as I showed you previously, but you can see when we looked at transcription of a number of SASP genes, it was significantly downregulated when we uh, decreased P16. We did this in a number of different cell lines, cell types, uh, different senescence inducers, so we feel pretty confident in this. So this is very interesting to me for two different reasons. One is that, you know, if we think about the SASP maybe being more detrimental than beneficial, we want to get rid of that, but it might be a good idea to keep the senescence associated cell cycle arrest. So here, you know, if we think about uh, loss of P16 expression, that may actually be what we can do. Here, taking some cancer cells, uh, we induce senescence using a topicide. So the cells with low P16 expression can still undergo senescence, but now we see a blunted SAS. So maybe this is good. Maybe we're keeping the tumor suppressive uh, benefits of senescence, but getting rid of the tumor promoting um, uh, detrimental parts of the SAS. Of course, still a lot to be done here, especially taking these studies in vivo. The other reason that we were very interested about this is because, of course, you know, if we think about uh, P16 being very highly relevant in cancer, we thought perhaps P16 uh, is associated with changes in the tumor microenvironment, which would, of course, be very important, not only in the context of anti-tumor immunity, but also an immune checkpoint blockade. So uh, when we took data from TCGA and we, um, we binned these tumors into P16 low versus P16 high, uh, and we ran gene set enrichment, we did note here that SASP was decreased not only in these two cancer types, but in a number of other cancer types where P16 is relevant. So this is really interesting. Um, the other interesting observation that we had were a number of terms associated with Im immunology or anti-tumor immunity were also significantly decreased. So DNA sensing, as I mentioned, so CGAS sting, uh, antigen processing and presentation, again, in a number of different cancer types. So we're working on this now, and we have some super insanely cool preliminary data, but I won't be able to share it with you today. But we have this kind of overall hypothesis based on everything we know so far, which is in P16 low cancers, they're creating sort of a hostile immune environment where sort of the good immune cells are on one side of the tumor, can't get in, and the bad immune cells are on the other side. So like I said, this has clear implications for immune checkpoint blockade and anti-tumor immunity, and we're following up these studies now. All right, to just give my final conclusion, so I, sh I said at the beginning of the talk, there's a clear interplay between P16 and the cell cycle. But I hope that I've provided evidence today to show you that this isn't the only role of P16. In fact, loss of P16 increases nucleotide synthesis. Loss of P16 looks to affect uh, DNA damage response, um, although these data are unpublished. Loss of P16 also decreases the SASP, which may be very important for the immune, uh, the tumor immune microenvironment. And as I mentioned, we're following up on this. All right, and some very last slide, I need to acknowledge all the people who did the work. I mentioned uh, Raquel Booth, who was a postdoc, now research faculty in the lab. Uh, Dr. Tangadu has been doing the DNA damage response. We were helped by many of uh, current and previous lab members. And of course, all of our wonderful collaborators. Uh, thank you to all of our funding. And I will put a shout out um, that we are hiring. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to talk to you. All right, and thank you all for your attention. Great, thanks. Very, that's excellent, Catherine. Very exciting. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna I just hand straight over to to Spasti, who's going to moderate the questions. Yeah, such such an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, there's lots of lots of questions coming in, but I think uh, one of the first ones that came up, which I'm actually also quite interested in, is. This whole idea that P16 is doing something beyond just cell cycle regulation, right, including nucleotide metabolism, do you think that is something specific to P16, or could it also be associated with other cell cycle inhibitors like P21, P27? Is, do you think it's something weird about P16, or is this a new wide principle 
I think it's 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 larger than that. So in fact, some data that um, we published when I again when I was a postdoc did show that there are other mechanisms. So basically, I think the cells figure out a way. They're highly metabolically plastic, and in that particular instance, it was through ATM. So a loss of ATM and then affected p53 and p21. The cells found a way to increase nucleotides. Uh, so I, I think that it this is a, a broader principle that the cells need nucleotides. I mean, it makes sense in terms of their proliferative capacity, but also for energy and, and all of these other um, interesting processes that happen as cells become go from, you know, benign to, to tumor. Yeah, I actually think that's, that's really cool. Um, and I guess one thing I'm surprised by, and there's a couple of questions uh, related to that here as well. So do you think that P16 loss alone, just by that one molecular event, we are tipping the balance in terms of nucleotide levels, et cetera? Or do you think, that, like you said, the cell is, has to be sort of metabolically poised to, to take advantage of the P16 loss? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, probably the, the, the latter. I, I think that P16 loss is sort of in concert with, with some other um, uh, reprogramming uh, in, inducing this change in metabolism. Clearly, uh, you know, mTORC has to be upregulated how, and how that's happening. I think this is going to be some, the, maybe the key to this question, and we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, and you know, in terms of the mTOR, I actually thought that was really interesting as well. And I kind of have a similar question. I think Zev has a similar question as well, which is that mTOR is a big sort of almost like an umbrella term, right? Like it's it's so many different translational processes. So Zev is asking, have you considered a wider set of changes in protein translation? Given, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a a whole polyseq uh, RNA seq poly yeah whatever polysome fractionation and followed by RNA seq. Um, and clearly, there's lots of things. And there's also a lot of things related to nucleotide metabolism other than RPIA. And so I think this points back to the salvage pathway being quite interesting. So these are, yeah, these are things that we're trying to kind of work out, you know, and, and why specifically upon loss of P16, these specific transcripts would change versus others. Um, obviously, we're trying to take a lot of um, a lot of knowledge out there in the field from David Sabatini and others um, on, you know, how certain transcripts are specifically translated. But I think there's there's still so much to do there. Yeah, because I'm I'm interested in the idea that I think p16 loss, like in terms of DNA damage repair defects, because a lot of what you're seeing is somewhat similar, right? And yeah. DNA damage repair can also sort of uh, transition between cell cycle regulation and external stimuli. And I'm just wondering if partly it's a stress response to the loss of P16, which is what's causing all these translational changes as opposed to anything directly that P16 is doing. So do you think it's a direct mechanism or something more indirect? Yeah, you know, we have some preliminary data to suggest it's more of a direct um, mechanism, um, but I, I think, you know, and we've tried to induce, you know, induce just a random stress to see whether there's similar changes and, and, it, and that's not the case. Um, but I think these are still things that we're, I really don't feel fully confident giving an answer one way or the other. We're still just trying to, you know, figure it out and, and really um, understand everything as best, you know, as deeply as we can, given the tools that we have. And have you looked at it? Have you looked at the effects of P16 loss in concert with, say, P53 mutation or loss of specific DNA damage repair genes? Like, is it, is it going to change or do you think P16 is like this linchpin? That. Yeah, that that's a great question. So in the in the kind of panel that we had of different cancer cell, you know, cell lines where we were changing p16 expression, they were universally everything looked the same, but they had obviously very different genetic backgrounds, you know, some had p53 mutations, some were p10 mutant. Uh, so I do think there's something very special about p16 kind of being at the center of all of these things. That doesn't mean to say that, you know, there might be um, even larger consequences if, for instance, there's a p53 mutation, which would make a lot of sense because then metabolism is just going to be just crazy. Um, so I, I do think there's there's it's a it's a both scenario. Um, 
there's a couple of questions that I'd like to save for the panel discussion in the end, because I think it would benefit from both your perspectives. Um, and there's also a couple of technical questions, but I'll pass them on to you later that you, you can reply to them. Um, but as a last question, um, to me, it's really, it's, it was interesting that you said that even in the cells that bypass senescence, so technically they're not, they're still cell cycling normally, you're still seeing that persistent DNA damage. So what, where do you think P16, and this is, I'm afraid I'm pandering to my own research interest, but where do you think P16 sits in terms of the DNA damage pathways? And, and you know, is, do you think it's specific to double strand break repair loss that's somehow acting in concert with P16? Yeah, yeah, maybe we can talk about this more um, offline a bit too, because th these are kind of the experiments we're doing right now. We're doing, you know, the alkaline and neutral comet and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have a suspicion that we have some replication stress just caused by the cells cycling with, a, you know, a lot of DNA damage, <laughs> um, which is, and so we have some, some preliminary data to suggest that. So I think it's more, that is a little bit maybe more nonspecific just from replication stress. But I'd love to get your thoughts on it for sure. No, yeah, it sounds super cool. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna let Peter introduce Judy and then we'll come back to you for questions at the end. Well, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks again, Catherine. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, it's also a great pleasure to in introduce uh, Judy Campisi. Um, so I don't think Judy really quite requires any introduction, but I'm going to um, have a go at summarizing, you know, what I think are some of her major achievements. Uh, so Judy has been a, a senior scientist at uh, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab since 1991. And since 2002, has had a second lab at the, the Buck Institute for research on, on aging. Um, and you know, thinking about Judy's contributions to the to the field, okay, I mean, you know, could real offer a long list of, of specific things, but I want to try and be more more general, okay. So th the first thing is that you know, Judy for many years has been a, a leading thinker. In, in this field, okay, and has been, you know, done a great job, I think, in terms of, you know, articulating the sometimes, you know, complex view of the benefits versus the detriments of, of cellular senescence, for example, for, for cancer, tumor suppression versus aging. Um, Catherine has already touched on that, and I think Judy will some more. Um, one of her major specific contributions is to, um, to, to have discovered the what's known as the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype, which is this, this pro-inflammatory phenotype, which characterizes senescent cells and res is responsible for, for many of their activities. Um, Judy has been you know, a great contributor to the field in terms of uh, you know, uh, providing resources. So for example, these three MR mice, which I, I know we have at SBP and can be used for eliminating senescent cells from, from tissues in, in vivo. Um, and finally, I, I think, you know, what I think is, is perhaps the most important thing is that, you know, for a long time before, you, you know, senescence started getting really hot and trendy, okay, and in my mind, that kind of goes back to, to 2005, you know, Judy was really carrying, I would say, carrying the torch for the, for the field and, you know, kind of kept things going. Um, and, and in that time, you know, made a number of really important contributions, which, you know, only now we, you know, we really appreciate the significance of. So, so first of all, you know, back in 1995, when, you know, a lot of people were discussing senescence as purely an in vitro phenomenon versus in vivo, Judy had already shown that senescent cells do exist in, in vivo, or at least features of senescent cells exist in, in vivo. I think that was the first demonstration of that. And also, actually, prior to 2005, if you, you know, if you read Judy's literature, Carefully, you know, she had already des described the, the SASP by, by that point, which is also a, you know, as I say, a, a major player now. So, so, you know, these were kind of critical observations which Judy had made when, you know, a lot of people were not focusing on, on senescence at the time, but now obviously are, are really 
you know, important observations and really have contributed to, you know, what is now, you know, the unquestionable excitement in the field and, you know, a lot of interest in senescence as a target for interventions, both for healthy aging and, and also for um, as, as, as cancer therapy. And I think Judy will talk about these areas in, in more detail. Uh, not surprisingly, Judy has won, you know, many different awards. I won't list them all in, in detail, but for example, a merit award from the, the NIA, the longevity prize from the Ibsen Foundation, and she's an elected member of the, the US National Academy of Sciences and, and, and other eminent bodies. And so um, I'll just hand over to Judy. Thanks very much for, for speaking, Judy. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peter, for this. Oh, dear. Uh, I seem to have lost my controls now. Okay. But I can can you see this screen because the camera yeah. fill up and you can't you can't see that. Okay, that's good. Um, let me start by thanking Peter for this kind introduction and also for this opportunity to share the um, platform with Catherine and to talk to all of you. And let me also say that Peter forgot to mention that when I started my career, I was only nine years old. So here we go. Um, I want to start by reminding you about aging. So of course, nobody dies of good health. We die of these horrible diseases. And there are many, many diseases that have very different functions, very different cell types, different manifestations. Many of them are degenerative. Cancer is the exception in that I would be hard pressed to call cancer a uh, degenerative disease. But what is interesting about all these diseases is they're very rare in young people. And then somewhere around the midpoint of our lifespan, all of these diseases rise with exponential kinetics. So those of us who work on aging, we think this is because there must be some basic aging processes that drive all of these diseases, or at least most of them. And as Catherine described, we think cell senescence qualifies for being one of those diseases. So let me give you just a slightly different um, overview of what we think, how we think about the senescence response. So as Catherine mentioned, it is essentially an irreversible growth arrest. And yes, we can do some molecular biological tricks to reverse that, but we think in vivo, at least for normal cells, um, they really don't divide again. And this of course is the basis for why this is such a powerful tumor suppressive mechanism. The second part is that many, but not all, senescent cells develop a resistance to dying. And so this is part of the reason why we think they persist and they increase with age. And the third is, as Peter mentioned and Catherine mentioned, this very complex secretory phenotype, which I'll tell you more about as we learn more about it. So there are two ways to think about senescence. So the first is anything that puts a cell at risk for cancer or even provides a stress that we associate with aging. So anything that damages the genome, the oncogenic mutations that Catherine talked about, but also things that derange metabolism. For example, advanced glycation end products and things like organelle stress. That's one way of looking at it. But the other way is that of course, this phenotype was under evolutionary pressure. And for 90% of our evolutionary history, there was no aging. People died of starvation or infection or predation. And so none of those diseases were a problem. So what was the purpose of developing this response? And of course, as Catherine pointed out, part of it is to prevent cancer in young organisms. But we now know that at least the secretory phenotype is important for embryonic development. It's important for the development of labor and it's important for a tissue repair and wound healing. So of course, the way we really need to think about this process is that it's an evolutionary balancing act. And this becomes extremely important when we begin to think about senescence as a 
a potential target for intervention because we want to preserve the good and of course avoid the bad. So one word about the biomarkers of senescence. Of course, there are now many, and I've listed some of them here and along with the references, but I do want to emphasize, and P16 is of course among one of, one of the more important um, uh, markers of senescence, but absolutely none of these markers are truly senescence specific. And that of course, uh, provides a challenge <laughs> to the field. Nonetheless, using many of these markers, many labs have begin, begun to ask and have begun to answer the question of when and where do you find senescent cells in vivo in a living organism, preferably a human? And the answer is twofold. They increase with age. To my knowledge, this is true for every vertebrate species that has been examined and even possibly some complex non-invertebrate um, species like Drosophila. And they're found in virtually every tissue that has been examined. They're also found at higher levels at the sites of age-related pathology. And I, I'm just giving you a few examples here. This is human skin in the bottom panel. Um, this is in the pulmonary artery of uh, patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And then of course in the brain, this is obviously aut autopsy material, Alzheimer's brains tend to have more senescent cells. Many of them are astrocytes, which of course are the origins of brain cancer. And there seems to be more of them in the disease brain compared to age matched controls. But the real challenge to the field is that these cells are never abundant. At the most, a few percent of cells in old diseased tissues are senescent. And so the question then becomes, how on earth could cells provide a background for such um, diverse uh, um, phenotypes and diseases? And then of course, the second question is, do they actually do anything? Because all of these biomarkers are just correlations. So let me start with how. At least I think there's consensus among the field that a large answer, not the only answer, but a large answer to the how is through the secretory phenotype. There are two arms which are under different molecular control. Some of them are uh, dependent on the transcriptional upregulation of the genes that code for the proteins that then produce these molecules. But there is also a transcriptional independent um, part of the secretory phenotype, which is often missed in many of the global uh, transcriptional anal analyses that are being currently done. But what both these arms have in common is they can drive inflammation. And many of you may know that years ago, Claudio Franceschi coined this term inflammaging to describe how you would be able to identify a young tissue and an old tissue. And his idea was you would look for low level infiltration of immune cells, primarily of the uh, um, innate immune system, but not necessarily only. There are also adaptive immune systems that come, uh, immune cells that come into the tissue. And we now know that this type of inflammation can destroy tissues, it can disrupt normal cells from functioning. Of course, the growth arrest prevents stem cells from undergoing proliferation and function. And of course, inflammation is a major risk factor for the development of cancer. And so even age-related cancers can be driven by this accumulation of senescent <coughs> inflammation. And then of course, I'll touch on this at the end. We also know that you never heal a wound if you don't have at least an initial inflammatory response. And the final point I want to make is we kind of call this inflammation plus because although many of the secreted factors are pro-inflammatory, there are other factors that seem not to have much to do with inflammation, but yet can provide um, the biological basis for aging uh, phenotypes and diseases.
So I'm just going to show you one example of how senescent cells, and remember the growth arrest is indeed highly protective against the development of cancer. There are mice and humans that lack P16 or other tumor suppressors, and they don't undergo senescence, and those animals and people die an early death due to cancer. But it turns out if you take, for example, this is an early experiment done by Anna Kratolica, if you take a pre-malignant breast epithelial cell line injected into the breast, they're pre-malignant, so they don't form tumors. But in the presence of senescent mammary fibroblasts, these tumors will convert to full-blown malignancy. And this uh, second panel shows human breast. So this is in an immune competent mouse. This shows what happens in an immune incompetent mouse. These are human breast cancer cells. And in the presence of senescent breast cancer, fibro breast fibroblasts, uh, these tumors are larger, they're more vascularized, and they will eventually metastasize. So we now have a strong feeling that many of these pro-tumor phenotypes of senescent cells is due to the secretory phenotype, but it is much more complicated than we ever envisioned. Um, this, this is an, actually an old, um, more than 10 years old, a slide from Jean-Philippe Coppe's paper. It shows an antibody array, so yellow is high, blue is low, but you can see that there are Meant, so he, what he did was he took fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the same tissue, prostate, same genotype, so same person. And you can see that there are some things that are senescent specific in both cases, both the stroma and the epithelium, but then there are some things that are epithelial specific and some things that are stromal specific. The same thing is true if we compare astrocytes and fibroblasts. There's about 50% overlap, but there are distinct factors that segregate with cell type. And there are species specific factors. The mouse has been a pretty good model for us, but it is not perfect. Um, it also depends upon how cells become senescent to begin with. So one of the mysteries in aging research is we don't really understand what drives senescence in aging, normal aging. What are the major drivers? Is it an activation of an oncogene? Is it some form of DNA damage? Is it mitochondrial dysfunction? But each inducer has its own cluster of secreted factors. And so the SAS depends on how the cells were induced to begin with. We're hoping this will give us clues to understand how senescent cells accumulate with age. Now, very recently in collaboration um, with Birgit Schilling, who was our mass spec guru at the Buck, and Nate Basisti, who is now um, has his own lab at the NIA, we did an exhaustive characterization of human cells. In this case, it's fibroblasts, but we've now extended it to other factors, to other cell types. And we looked at um, exoradiation, so a direct DNA damaging agent, um, oncogenic RAS, which you've heard about. And even this drug here, atazanavir, is a drug that's being used to treat patients with HIV AIDS. It's a protease inhibitor. And what you can see is that although there's overlap and what we call a core SASP, there are also um, a number of factors that are just specific to each particular inducer. And very recently we expanded this. So these are all proteins. Some of them are soluble, some of them are exosomes, but very recently we expanded this to bioactive lipids, primarily lipids of the leukotriene and prostaglandin family. And so this is work that was done by Chris Wiley. He now has his own lab at, at Tufts University in Boston. And we are now convinced that these bioactive lipids are in fact um, uh, very important for a number of, of the phenotypes that we associate with aging. I should point out that although many of these lipids are secreted, which is what you would expect, for leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Some of them remain intracellular 
where they regulate pathways, for example, endogenous rafts. And at least one of them we're now hoping will be a biomarker for the death of senescent cells or so-called senolysis, which I'll touch on later. Now, as Peter mentioned, we were, there were all these correlative studies and we were really impelled to try to ask the question, do these senescent cells actually do anything in vivo? And the way we did this was by making a transgenic mouse model. This mouse model takes advantage of the fact that P16 is so commonly expressed by senescent cells. And we used an artificial bacterial chromosome that now preserves the endogenous P16 loci, but introduces a transgene in which the promoter for P16 drives this fusion protein that allows us to visualize senescent cells to eventually, um, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, to eventually be able to sort them from cells, but most importantly, the ability to take this prodrug, ancyclovir, convert it into a toxic DNA chain terminator. Senescent cells, of course, don't replicate nuclear DNA, but what happens is uh, this phosphorylated derivative gets into the mitochondria, fragments the mitochondrial genome, and the cells die by apoptosis. So we have shared our mouse model with literally dozens of labs. And I should point out there's a similar mouse model made by our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic. And that mouse model also uses a P16 promoter element and it drives a different killer gene, but it's the same principle. And between us, we have shared our, our mice with literally dozens and dozens of labs working on different diseases of aging. I've stopped trying to keep up with this list, but you can see that it covers virtually all of the diseases I showed you on my first slide. So I think what that tells us is that we can say senescent cells, at least in a mouse, are causative drivers of aging phenotypes and diseases. Now, I'll just show you a tiny bit of data that especially as it relates to cancer. This is work that was done by Marco Di Maria, who now has his own lab um, uh, in Arriba in, in Groningen. What Marco did was he treated mice with a single dose of either genotoxic or cytotoxic chemicals that are used to treat cancer. This is a rising problem in the field where young people are treated with these, these agents, they do cure cancer. But 20 years later, these patients are developing signs of premature aging. And so in the mice, these animals develop a burden of senescent cells. And Marco asked, what is the cost? And the first thing he looked at was cancer metastasis. So he used a a uh, cancer cell line, breast cancer cell line, it expresses now a different luciferase. And it's known if you inject these into the inguinal mammary gland, they metastasize to the lung and the liver. So here's the example, here's the uh, experiment we did. We give the animals breast cancer, we wait till the tumor grows, and then we give them a drug, in this case, doxorubicin, and then either treat with gancyclovir or not to clear the senescent cells that are induced by this chemotherapeutic agent. And you can see, so here's the control animal. This is the primary tumor, metastasis to the liver, metastasis to the lung. Here are the gancyclovir treated animals. We have variable effects on the primary tumor, which we're still studying, but um, in no case did we get a, met a metastatic lesion. And our feeling is, is that this is because the milieu, the systemic milieu has been altered by eliminating senescent cells. These drugs are cardiotoxic. You can see that you lose ejection fraction and fractional shortening if you treat with doxorubicin. But if you give the animals gancyclovir right after the chemotherapy, you can prevent that loss of, of heart function. And the animals and people as well develop a clotting phenotype, which is easy to measure in the mouse. Again, if you treat with gancyclovir immediately after the um, 
uh, the chemotherapy, we can prevent that proclotting phenotype. Now, I want to make one comment, though, about all of these experiments. If we wait too long, for example, if we wait until, say, weeks after the cardiotoxicity has, has caused the heart to begin to fail, we cannot reverse the phenotype. So the important thing is to eliminate senescent cells shortly after they are formed by the chemotherapy in order to prevent these deleterious effects. So the idea is with age, we accumulate senescent cells. They secrete molecules that cause neighboring cells to fail to function. And of course, we're all accumulating pre-malignant cells. And we would argue that senescent cells can even drive late life cancer. So of course, as I alluded to earlier, the SASP evolved for a good purpose, and that's to promote wound healing and tissue repair, among other things. And so here's an example of whole body luminescence. We make a little um, skin, we make a small uh, in, uh, punch biopsy on the dorsal flank of the animals. There's this wave of senescence, just to point out male and female mice, heal their wounds differently, females are faster. And so these are female mice, and you can see there's a peak of senescence, which we can prevent with gancyclovir. And now we ask, what happens to wound healing? And these are the senescent free mice. Wound healing is retarded, and these wounds have more scarring. And what Marco found by sorting the cells from the wound is that senescent cells are producing this understudied isoform of platelet-derived growth factor, which if he topically applies it, can completely reverse the slow wound healing phenotype. So this is all great news, except what I've just told you should puzzle you. Senescent cells accumulate with age, including in the skin. I showed you that. Everyone knows wound healing doesn't get better with age. It gets worse. So why is that? We answered this question in a collaboration with Simon Mellow. All of this work was done by Michael Villardi, who now has his own lab in, in the Philippines. This is a keratin-specific Cree. So it's a skin-specific ability to excise this potent antioxidant gene. And it's controlled, the Cree is controlled by tamoxifen. And so when we knock this gene out in the skin, we see an accumulation of senescent cells in the skin. The difference is these senescent cells persist. And now we can ask what happens to wound healing. And again, wound healing is retarded. So the idea is, is that evolution selected for the transient presence of senescent cells. But with age, these cells can become persistent and then they can drive aging and age-related phenotypes. So of course, all of you are gonna run out and get our transgene and ask somebody in China or Saudi Arabia or some foreign country where they don't have an FDA to um, go ahead and make you transgenic. And then you'll take your gancyclovir and you'll be senescent free. So of course that's not going to happen. And so the question is, are there drugs that can do this? And of course there are. Now two very exciting new classes of drugs are uh, gaining uh, traction in the literature. Senolytics are drugs that selectively kill senescent cells, sort of like our transgene. And senomorphics are drugs that selectively suppress uh, certain aspects of the cells. I, I should point out that um, the good news about senolytics is that they seem not to be needed continuously. That is, at least in the animal studies and the very few studies that have been done in human tissues, you can administer a senolytic, take it away, and it takes time before senescent cells accumulate. Senomorphics do require more or less selective pressure from the drug. We, we're obviously more excited about senolytics than senomorphics um, because there's really no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. Of course, everyone always asks if there are these senolytic drugs on the horizon, of course, they're going to hold promise for extending our health span. What about lifespan? And unfortunately, or fortunately, 
This experiment has been done by Jan van Dersen at, at the Mayo Clinic with his transgenic mouse in which he treated throughout life um, their drug that would kill senescent cells. And what he showed was that he got an impressive increase in median lifespan, but no increase in maximum lifespan. And that argues that we still have a long way to go to understand species specific lifespan and what truly limits um, our lifespan. But we're on the way to understanding what it is that limits our health span. And so I'll just end by um, sort of echoing what, what Catherine said is we're at very early stages. There's still so much we need to know. We need to understand um, how there is specificity among different senolytic agents. There are none that are effective against all senescent cells. That might be good. There may be times when you want to eliminate senescent cells only in the kidney or only in the eye. We don't know how to do that. Of course, we also know that there are some senescent cells that are beneficial. And so we, we want to understand what the difference is between the good guys and the bad guys. And can we um, find a way to maximize the, the beneficial effects and minimize the uh, de de deleterious effects? And then of course, this is remarkable, remarkable plasticity. I should tell you our recent data say that the SAS is not static. It changes over time, sometimes over months. And so we need to understand that plasticity and need to understand when and where there should be um, the very best uh, administration of these drugs. And I will um, stop here and give credit to all the people in the lab, many of whom have recently left, like in the last three months, to great jobs. Um, past lab members who we still collaborate with and a huge number of collaborators without whom none of this work would be possible. And, and just to let you know, there's also uh, some questions in the Q&A and I'll just, I'll just allow um, Zosti to, to, to comment on that and I'll stop. Thanks, Judy. Really enjoyed that. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you this afternoon. Um, I'll hand over to Svasti. Such an interesting talk. I know there's already questions coming up, uh, but I, I want to ask a really quick question. So in the, in the story where you showed us the effect of senescence on metastasis, is it that the senescent cells themselves are becoming more motile or are they inducing the cells around them? That, that's a great question. So our primary hypothesis, which we have data for, but we haven't eliminated another hypothesis. The primary hypothesis is that the senescent cells are um, creating a systemic milieu that is conducive to those few cells that will leave the primary tumor and establish um, a metastatic growth. And we've even identified some candidates of the SAS, mostly uh, CXCL1 and CXCL3, but there are other factors as well. But we can't rule out the fact that the senescent cells themselves are traveling. Some, so we're still working on trying to sort that out. That, that's so fascinating because I know in cancer, we often think about this dichotomy between a very active cell cycle progression versus metastasis because so many of the same factors are shared between making a cell motile and dividing chromosomes inside the nucleus. And so, you know, when you think about the compartmentalization, I think that, that's really fascinating. Um, and along the same lines, Guy had a question as to, in general, example from macrophages, when damps like interleukin-1 family members are released, you need to have the cells lice. But that's not the case with senescent cells, right? No. So senescent cells will release proteins like HMGB1 or IL-33 uh, without lysing. They, so in the case of HMGB1, it's really interesting because HMGB1 is a major regulator of nuclear structure. You know, it binds DNA. It leaves the nucleus and is exported and then outside the cell, it becomes a damp. And what is interesting was we were able to show that HMGB1 is transcribed and translated normally. And then what happens is it's imported into the nucleus 
and then rapidly export it out of the nucleus and export it out of the cell. So if we inhibit, for example, um, nuclear import, we can disrupt that whole process. So it's a very different mechanism from say the way macrophages act to stimulate uh, inflammation. That's, that's really interesting. And along those lines, the senolytics that, we, that you were talking about that can um, induce the death of these senescent cells, is that through an artificial pathway or is it one of the endogenous regulated pathways of cell death? So it depends on, on the senolytics. There are many now. There are, in, again, it's another list I can't keep up with. But the early ones were inhibited, inhibitors of the BCL2 family members. So many senescent cells, not all, but many of them slightly increase those family members. And then if you inhibit them, uh, you will cause them the cells to undergo uh, uh, basically a, a, a classic cell death pathway, usually through activated caspase 3. Again, not always. What I will point out is that those early senolytic drugs were often failed anti-cancer drugs. And in thinking about the dichotomy between aging and cancer, it's important to remember that if you need to kill a cancer or, or cure a patient of cancer, you have to kill every cancer cell because anyone that's alive could go on and cause tumor regrowth. In the case, at least from our transgenic mouse models and also from the Mayo's mouse models, you don't need to kill every senescent cell. You just need to lower that burden by maybe 70 to 80%, and that's enough to give health benefits. So this is why these failed anti-cancer drugs, which have toxic side effects, can be used as senolytics. So short treatments, lower doses, and then you don't have to be on the drug for very long or very high dose. That is so interesting. Uh, can I actually ask, based on that answer actually, can I ask Catherine to also turn on your, your video and um, audio just so I can get both of your comments on this. This idea of you know tumor recurrence and sort of waking up potentially is it a way that you could wake up senescent cells so that they remain dormant, they're not responding to therapy, you think the cancer has been cured, but then, you know, like, especially with things like ER positive breast cancer, where 15 years later, you have disease recurrence. Do you think one of the causal pathways is these senescent cells somehow reawakening, maybe through P16 loss or something? Well, I, I mean, the thing to remember is that all cancer cells, including those that have arrested growth in vivo, so-called senescent cancer cells, they're not normal, they're mutant. And every day of your life, you're breathing oxygen and introducing new mutations. So it's possible that senescent cells might drive cancer recurrence. It's also possible that a cancer cell now acquires a new mutation that allows it to ignore the senescent signal. I, I don't know, Catherine, how you feel, but I don't think we can distinguish between those two possibilities right now. I think it's a, a, a really actually important question and we, we're trying to figure this out in the lab, but the, the, you know, the tools to do it, uh, it's actually quite, quite a challenging question for sure. And I think there are people that are interested in both you uh, inducing senescence and then using a senolytic and cancer or the opposite, what you mentioned, Svasti, you know, taking dormant senescent cells and reactivating them so that they will be more, um, you know, more prone to cell death by a, a chemo or, or some targeted therapy. I think these are things people are in, very interested in trying. And let me put in a plug for a colleague of mine. So I have a program project with Jan Vich, who is at Einstein. So what Jan is able to do now, not in a massive uh, in massive quantities, but he's able to get whole genome sequencing of individual cells. And I think this is prime uh, target for asking whether the, the mutations in a primary arrested pre-malignant lesion, what we call a pre-malignant lesion, whether those cells have acquired new mutations when they become a recurring cancer. So I know he's interested in that and I think we'll have some answers in coming years. And, and you know, I think another really interesting facet that came out from both your talks is this idea of 
tissue specificity or even cancer type specificity. So do you think that there are actually maybe different senescent cell types based on the tissue they're in or the cancer they're in, and they have like distinct epigenetics or distinct functions or distinct SASPs? Yes, yes, and yes. Yep. <laughs> So I guess that makes the whole thing more complicated, right? Because I, I assume the normal senescent cells are different from the ones in the tumors. And I wonder, it, do you think it's also different based on the age of the person? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. If you, if you isolate senescent cells from even a young and an old mouse from the same uh, organ. So they're rare in young and more abundant in old, but still, they're still pretty rare. And then you compare them they're not exactly the same. I mean, there are similarities, of course, but they're not the same. To, to me, that's really crazy, actually. That just blew my mind, because I would have thought of it as, okay, so you have senescent cells, and they perform the similar function based on where they are, but the idea that they'd be different, what does that mean for therapeutics? Does that mean if you're older, you're, the way they respond is going to be different, even to the senolytics, or? Well, remember that um, certainly we have the other labs have done this too. If you even take cells in culture, I am our 90s, you know, which I think Catherine and I would say is our favorite cell type. You take, make them senescent in culture and you do, you can do, for example, single cell analysis or, or mass spec on their, on their SAS and you let them go for a few months. You come back a few months later, same cells sitting in the incubator for a few months. You get differences in the SAS differences in, in their transcriptomes, they're changing. It kind of upsets me a little bit when people call them zombie cells. I mean, they're very active and they're changing their phenotype. And, and yes, it makes it more complicated. So all the students and postdocs that are on this, if you work in senescence, you will not be without a job. <laughs> well, that's good news. Um, I, I'm gonna, I know in the interest of time, we should probably stop, but I'm having too much fun. So I'm gonna ask the last question that came up in Q&A because I think that's really interesting is, what do you think is the interaction or overlap between senescent cancer cells and cancer stem cells or less differentiated cells? And, and do you think that that would play a role in making new therapies or developing new therapies? Is there actually an overlap? Because they have some similar phenotypes, I suppose. Well, even normal cells, normal stem cells can express P16, not at huge levels, but they do express P16. Would you call those senescent? I, I don't think so, because, you know, physiological signals will wake up those cells and get them to divide. I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what, what, what Catherine's experience is, but if we overexpress P16 in a normal cell, at low levels, we can usually reverse the growth arrest by reinstating P16. But at high levels, after three to five days, we, we cannot reverse that growth arrest. So again, things are changing. Um, and P16 is sort of the trigger that then I think tells the cell, hang in there, we may need you, or forget it, <laughs> you're never gonna divide again. Did you have anything to add to that, Catherine? Or yeah, I think I get this question a lot in the dormancy question too. Although I think dormancy is maybe still less, even less understood <laughs> than senescence and, and cancer stem cells. But I think there's a, a very distinct difference between cancer stem cells and a senescent cell. Um, and I mean that even that in and of itself is going to have clear implications for for treating a, a you know a heterogeneous tumor. Um, so these are, you know, like Judy said, we are not out of jobs um, by any stretch of the imagination. Really understanding the interplay between all of these cells too. Just, just thinking about how the SAS could affect a cancer stem cell would be fascinating, yeah. Peter, did you have any questions? Otherwise I'll ask a last question and I'll... Uh... Yeah, I, I did have a, a question and it's good to, to have them, uh, both Judy and Catherine on the line for this one. So. So, so Catherine, you showed that, that uh, mTOR1 promotes some of the effects of, of senescence bypass after down regulation of, of P16, but, but, but Judy, you've also shown that, that mTOR1 promotes some phenotypes of senescence, for the SASP, for example. So, 
I wondered if the, the, the two of you could, um, I mean, I could, well, just explain what's going on there. Peter, I have thought about this question for so long and you're the first person to ask it and I don't have a brilliant answer. <laughs> we do see a modest increase. I knew, I knew you would have thought about it, yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we see this increase and, and we've actually seen a, an increase in IL-1 alpha translation because we have the polyc thing. What's interesting to us is that the rest of the SASP is down. Um, I just, I really don't have any good explanation other than maybe there's some clear specificity and how mTOR is regulating these different um, transcripts that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, the, I, I, the, I mean, the contexts are very different, you know, with and without P16, if, if nothing else, obviously. Yeah, we have not looked, Catherine, at the effects of rapamycin, for example, on P16, high expressors or even low expressors, just normal senescence. But what I will tell you is, it's true, we published that um, inhibition of TOR C1 does suppress one arm of the SAS, but I never, we never meant to imply it suppresses the entire SAS. It doesn't. There are still things that are secreted. So there are specific targets of TOR C1 and then others that are unaffected. And so that needs to be explored more, I think. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's all these complications with the immune system. And, oh. um, so last question, and I know it's late, so anyone who has to leave, feel free, except the panelists don't leave. But uh, the last question is, um, can you both speculate a bit about the potential differences between senescent cells in the cancer context versus those in terms of chronic inflammation diseases like arthritis or arthritis sclerosis? Is there a difference? And what sort of differences would you think if there is? Well, in terms of the SAS, it's hard to know because there's been so few that have been fully characterized. But there's lots of overlap. For example, if you look at um, senescent chondrocytes in an osteoarthritic joint, the SAS is very similar to IMR 90s that are induced by radiation to a cancer cell that is induced by um, some sort of chemotherapy. So there's overlap for sure. I, I think the key to understanding that is understanding how the immune system responds to these signals. And honestly, the immune system terrifies me. It's so complicated. <laughs> if you think senescence is complicated, and we're just at an early stage of beginning to understand, especially the adaptive immune system, I think. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I know we've tried using the, the anti-interleukins that work really well for, for people with chronic arthritis, but they don't really work that well in the tumor context. We've tried it for multiple cancers, right? And they're just not that effective. So, I mean, clearly there are differences, but it seems like you say, as usual, quite complicated. <laughs> And remember, like there are tumors that overexpress, say, PDTF receptors. Well, senescent cells are expressing PDTFA. And so there are other things that can drive tumor genesis that are not necessarily the result of the kind of chronic inflammation we associate with things like arthritis. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you both for excellent talks and a really wonderful discussion. And I'm really looking forward to talking to each of you later, but I think right now everyone else will sign out except the trainees who are going to stick around for the roundtable discussion.